All right, so for those of you just tuning in, we're about to spectate a free-for-all King of the Hill game, including Clayman versus the world. We'll be taking on some of the top-rated players in AoE2 HD. Kaladin is Telemachos, for those of you who are curious. During this video, as always, I'll be giving you all my commentary behind the player's civilization choices and strategies to improve your overall understanding of the Age of Empires 2 metagame. So if you're looking to learn more about Age of Empires 2 and see some crazy entertaining games, you are at the right channel. Uh, I do live stream regularly on Twitch every Saturday. Find the streaming schedule in the description below, as well as my Facebook and Twitter. So without further ado, let's get this game started. And thank you again, Barbarous King and MemTV, for hosting my channel today. For those of you who are super new to Age of Empires 2, I recommend checking out my Netrush tutorial first, and I've got a lot of other expert game commentaries. I plan to cast more expert games in the future, I think, in addition to community games. But without further ado, into the game itself. It's free-for-all King of the Hill, and that means that the player that owns control of this monument when the timer hits zero wins the game. Uh, it starts, I think, at about 500 years, and then it starts ticking down, and when that timer hits zero, if you have units near it and it's your color, then you win. It is last man standing, though, and there are the teams are unlocked, so what that means is that players will have no teammates at the start. They're able to form alliances with each other, but only one of them can win the game. So, let's say that Joe Nall is on a team with Eli and Robsy, and Joe Nall has control of the middle when the timer hits zero, then only Joe Nall wins, and the rest of his teammates lose. What this does is it creates a really interesting dynamic where you are naturally encouraged to form alliances in the early game to try and survive. You are statistically just more likely to last into the late game the fewer enemies that you have, especially if you're smart about it and you actually pick the people adjacent to you to be on your team. However, at the very end, you have to make sure that you have a contingency plan in case to stage a little bit of a coup d'etat and make sure that you take them down at the last possible moment. If you are playing King of the Hill, when should you go for the middle? Generally speaking, when the timer hits about 100 years remaining is around the threshold where you gotta go for it. Otherwise, the clock is gonna be too low and you'll never make it in time, which is the story of every free-for-all King of the Hill game I've casted. Most of them turn out to be pretty good. I try not to do them too often so it doesn't get super repetitive, but... Some of the best matches on my YouTube channel have definitely been the free-for-all King of the Hill games. I look forward to seeing what Clayman and these other players bring to the table today. Let's start by taking a brief moment to introduce all the players. We have Joe Nall. He will be our Red Slobs player today. And we have Robsy as the Blue Mongols. We have Rage Master, aka Dot Dot, playing as the Green Aztecs. Gazna, aka Phoenix, will be the Orange Persians. Eli is our Teal Vikings player. Kaladin, aka Telemachos, will be the Grey Malians. And the legend himself, Clayman47, will be playing as the Yellow Japanese. Looking forward to seeing what he brings to the table. Clayman, known for his absurd Age of Empires 2 meme videos, and it was fun doing that little collab with him recently. Uh, you guys in the chat voted as part of my live stream to let him stay in this game. He did sign up for the wrong drawing. He is 300 ELO below the minimum requirement for this specific game. But for those of you who are not 1800 plus, I host lobbies for players of all skill levels. So if you actually come to my live stream, then you have a, you have a chance to play. I always I do a wide variety of games for everybody. So we're putting in Clayman in here. He's the wild card. <laughs> we'll see what his plan is. He's playing as the Japanese. Speed of the Law's favorite civilization. I love this Civ. 25% faster attack speed on the infantry units is surprisingly really good. It's essentially like having 25% extra damage output on your infantry units. It's very noticeable with Halberdiers, allowing them to shred right through Paladins. Because they have a massive attack bonus versus them, right? So if you get off additional attacks, you're getting way more value out of the attack speed bonus. It gives them a fairly threatening men-at-arms rush, it makes their elite samurai, their champions, and everything super terrifying. And the Civ has a pretty good economy, honestly, as far as most Civs go. I'd put them around the middle of the tier list, maybe middle upper, because the cheaper cost of the lumber camp and the mill and whatnot, mining camps, that actually adds up. Yeah, having an extra 150 wood on the way up to the feudal age could mean that you could build a blacksmith, for example, or you almost have enough wood to build another military building. That could be farms, and the more mills and whatnot you build, the more value you get. You end up saving a lot of wood over the course of the game, and this is a fairly diverse tech tree, especially with the addition of bloodlines and the HD expansions on Steam. I think that the Civ is quite solid, and just the Japanese are a great Civ, I think, for beginner players in that they generally have answers to everything since they have such a broad tech tree, so you just need to learn what units to make. And when you're new, I recommend just building a wide variety of units to make your army less easy to counter. 
Uh, Hungry Halberd Eater says it's actually 33% faster. I do watch some Spirit of the Lost stuff. <laughs> I instinctively say 25% faster, uh, and I don't... But I, I could have sworn it was actually more complicated than that for some stupid reason, like the Slavs farming bonus of 15% faster. Is it actually 15% faster? It, it That's just kind of how it works out in the game. Like, I thought that was what the Japanese one was. I, I might be wrong on that. I have to double check that. In that it's not technically 25%, but it evens out to be that. So, yeah, I gotta double check that one. Regardless, it's pretty good. Okay, because I thought it was like 25%. I'm pretty sure it's 25% faster attack speed, but it actually ends up being 33% more DPS. Again, it's just... The point being is that the Japanese have good infantry units and a wide variety of military units at their disposal. Uh, when in doubt, I would say that having a good mix of units, like something from your archery range plus barracks, can be just a really solid build from the Japanese. And thank you so much, TK to PK, for your 19-month resub. So, right off the bat, though, for those of you who are watching, a little tip, uh, make sure that you keep your water buffaloes underneath your town center. Uh, the most important tip I can give for advanced players is that it's all about, Age of Empires 2 is all about efficiency. I think that's what makes games like StarCraft 1, for example, so compelling to watch, is just the little ways that players take advantage of the game mechanics to be as efficient as humanly possible with every little maneuver that they, they make, and, and this is not that efficient. Uh, by having your water buffalo or sheep or whatever directly underneath your town center they only have to sit up to drop off the food and all that little walking time really really adds up that's why we see players rebuilding lumber camp so frequently you'd think that the additional hundred wood doesn't make up for it but that is not the case at all you absolutely want to be replacing your lumber camps when they're about four tiles away from the uh, when the lumber camp is four tiles away from the tree line you want to keep replacing it. That's why we also see sometimes players putting down two lumber camps in the Dark Age rather than just putting like eight villagers in the same one, because once you have like four or five, they start to bunch up on each other. We see, for example, Rob C actually with the secondary lumber camp just to make sure that he's getting the most value out of it and the villagers aren't clumping up on each other, and that will turn out to be very much worthwhile for him. Take a look at the map. I would say Eli's map is absolutely awesome the way it's set up. Look at this tree line. Sick. I mean, it's almost awesome, except his... Main gold is heavily exposed, and secondary gold too, and his stone. So he's a very safe base, but his gold generation is total crap. So Eli is very vulnerable to rush from Rob C. He's going to have to be quite careful about that one. Uh, I would say that this mining camp placement is suboptimal. Actually, uh, when it comes to lumber camps, you want to build your lumber camp right up against the tree line because trees disappear very quickly. It recede the tree line recedes away from you, but the gold mines have 800 gold on them. So takes a long time for them to disappear. Therefore, you actually want to put the mining camp one tile backward from the gold mine to get the maximum efficiency. Like this is okay, but this prevents him from actually saturating this uh, more heavily without ending up with some bunching villagers. But this is fine because at this stage in the game, Eli is just not going to need the gold where that really matters, but just little tips like this. Like for example, Rob C's uh, mining camp is actually immaculately well placed. This mill as well is also immaculately well placed. If you put it up here, again, they would still get bunched up on each other. So little tips like these, which I hope help you guys yes. uh, optimize your gameplay and bring it to the next level. Once you've mastered the basics of the game, which is just making sure that you're constantly creating villagers from your town center or researching technologies, you're always doing something with it, and that you've seen my tutorial videos so you have a general idea of things, then it's about just being more efficient. And also, of course, being able to adapt and read the situation. Speaking of the situation, Kaladin is going to get... This is so it looks like a 5 Militia Dress from the Aztecs player. So what I like to see here from Green is that he's taking full advantage of his Civilization bonuses. This is a strategy that's fairly common in competitive Age of Empires 2 for the Aztecs specifically because in the Conqueror's expansion, they have Free Loom, which means that since you start with 100 gold, everyone plays in standard resources. Start with 100 gold, that allows you to make 5 Militia because they're 20 gold apiece. Now, in the HD expansions, that's been changed because that bonus is really strong. It effectively, 
gives you one villager lead in the early game combined with their extra carrying capacity, which means the villagers spend less time walking, drop off resources. It just gives them a really powerful early game. So instead they get plus 50 gold, so they still have to research loom like all the other pleb civilizations. Still though, this does allow them to go for the five militia drush, of which most civs can't efficiently do because they do want to get loom in the early game. Uh, that way, because if you don't get loom, then you're so vulnerable to those early game rushes, and you're also more likely to lose villagers to boars, but in general it's really just the rush fear. Combat typically picks up in Age of Empires 2 somewhere around the 10 minutes range, and they have the 5 Militia Drush plus the Eagle Scout too. The Aztecs really have the tools in their Civ bonuses to leverage this type of aggressive play. So great to see Green going for a 5 Militia Drush back to the Eagle Scout. The Eagle Scout has better attack stats than the Scout Cavalry. Until we get to the Feudal Age though, in which the plus 2 attack is automatically applied to all Scout Cavalry units, uh, giving the Scout Cavalry actually a, a viable rush build. Uh, let's see how... Uh, Kaladin defends against this one. I wonder what he's gonna do. It looks like he's going for a fearless fast castle age. Now when it comes to free-for-all King of the Hill games, generally speaking we see players favor more defensive play, and this is because these games could go on for a while. You want to make sure that you... It's a big risk when you go for something like a 5 militia rush, because it really slows down your feudal age timing, and there are so many players in the game, so many variables at play, that if you end up you know, going for like a tower rush or something crazy, you end up crippling yourself, and then the guy next door, you know, maybe Joe Null decides he's, he's fed up with green, just comes in and kills you, because you wasted all your resources really slowing yourself down. So, we do see players in Free Fall King of the Hill games trying to go for rush builds, but they generally don't commit to them very heavily. You know, maybe they'll go for some knight raiding or some scout raiding, but their focus will be on getting the Imperial Age and ensuring that on an individual level, they are in the strongest possible position. I do think, though, that a 5 Militia Drush is totally fine. Uh, it'd be really cool to see if he commits to Men at Arms, and holy shit, is that what he's doing? Are those Eagle Scouts? I think those are actually Eagle Scouts. I know those are Eagle Scouts because I saw the 5 Villagers on gold, yeah. And this is pretty cool, too. So, I actually would like to see the Men at Arms upgrade here. I think that the Men at Arms upgrade gets immense value if you have Militia left over from your uh, Drush in the early game. I'd say that if you have three or more, that I would almost always get the Men at Arms upgrade. I can see why he's not doing this, though. Uh, has your relief asked, do you have any YouTube videos on builds, like, how to Scout Rush, etc.? I have plenty of videos where I showcase that, like, you can see my Doubt's Endless Scout Rush video, uh, but I think that my Night Rush build, like, if you can master that, you can adapt that build order to uh, cover most strategies. I don't have a specific one for the Scout Rush yet, but I have plenty of videos where I talk about it, so you can just go through my AOE2 tutorials playlist, watch them all, watch any video that contains a Scout Rush, and you'll get a fairly good feel for it. So. When you have five militia left, I think that the men at arms upgrade is, is fantastic value to get, absolutely, to apply that extra pressure. You have to be very careful with this control here. Maybe he's going to back into that town center range. Early game rushes are all about avoiding the enemy town center and trying to find those vulnerable exterior villagers. And that's why we see players strategically placing their buildings in a way to create choke points that funnel units underneath the TC. Very bold going for a fast castle age build here from uh, Kaladin, but... I think this might pay off, you know, when you see the 5 Militia Drush like this, you know the Castle Age is fairly far away here from green, and it's... it's here. Not that bad, actually. I would have to say that for a 5 Militia Drush, this is a pretty sick Castle Age timing. You know why the Castle Age timing is so good from green? Is that's because he didn't commit to Men at Arms. Men at Arms would have slowed him down, and instead he was opting for what appears to be an Eagle Warrior Rush. Now, he does not have the resources, I think, to research Eagle Warrior. I think it's 300 food and 200 gold. So he's got the backwards amount of resources, but I think he's saving up for it. I think he's going to get it right now. And by going for Eagle Scouts instead of really committing to Men at Arms, I do think it would be a big mistake. Uh, it just becomes easier and easier to counter over time. They're a very powerful early game unit to leverage with watchtowers and whatnot, because it just comes out really quickly. You only need a barracks. Uh, and you can make the militia earlier on. Yeah, I do believe he is going to get that Eagle Warrior upgrade now. Is that correct? Yes, it is. This is such a sick strategy here from Rage Master. I now know what the video title is going to be aggressive Aztecs Eagle Warrior play. This is so, so sick. Going for Eagle Scouts, they only cost 50 gold and 20 wood, and that's a much better resource distribution to actually be spending when you're thinking about getting the cast leaves. That's why we often see players transition. The metagame has shifted heavily towards archer play over the years uh, for a number of reasons, but one of them is that massing up archers in the Feudal Age doesn't slow down your cast leaves timing nearly as much because the primary resource cost there is gold rather than uh, 
you know, food. And even though the Eagle Warriors cost food, it's much easier to mine gold in the early game. You gotta build farms which cost 60 wood, and then the villagers don't gather from them that quickly, and then you run out of efficient farm space pretty quickly, so... This allowed him to get a, just a nice castle timing, and I would say that he uh, has been managing his economy very efficiently as well. Just a great double racks, uh, five militia drush play with Eagle Warriors, and oh, this is sick. I still think that you get the men-at-arms upgrade at this point, especially because now he can heal his militia. What a fantastically awesome build here from Green, one of the most creative builds I've seen on stream. I love it when people do this. This is an extremely viable build, by the way, in the uh, in the expansions. This does not work nearly as well in the Conquerors, though, because in the Steam expansions, the Eagle Warrior unit, like, there's an Eagle Scout unit now, and then you can upgrade it for 300 food and 200 gold to an Eagle Warrior, so it has 5 extra HP, it has 1 extra Pierce Armor, and I believe it has some extra attack bonuses, I have to double check that. Um, but, that's really good. Like, that's really, really good. The Eagle Warrior is one of those units which is, like, almost good enough to make, but not quite, and it's still not generally favored over something like Knights, but... It's an option, man, and the massive creation time of Eagle Scouts is offset by the 15% reduced training time on all military units that the Aztecs have, so it's just pretty sick. And now he's just, like, forwarding with monks? This build's awesome! This build's awesome, and it's basically designed to hard counter poor, uh, poor Gray. What a goddamn forward siege workshop, too. The madman. He's... <laughs> I'm glad I let him in this game. The thing is, is that... This build, like, works better with knights usually, like a Drush Fast Castle Agent of Knights, it, it usually does, but it can certainly work with the Aztecs, absolutely. And the Eagle Warriors are the type of unit in the expansions where they're situational, but they're on that fringe viability. And, and what's really paying dividends here is the monks that he's mixing in, like, this build is sick, and it wouldn't work if he didn't do everything perfectly. This is awesome! Absolutely awesome. If you've been enjoying watching this video so far and you like this strategy, please do share it around. Leave a comment, leave a thumbs up. It really helps me out. And the other thing that really helps me out is if you check out the content I do for games beyond just Age of Empires 2. I think you'll find it very entertaining and it also motivates me to continue producing AOE content and just help expose more people to the Age of Empires community. Double kill! He killed two of his own knights with his own Megan L blast. Absolute disaster! <laughs> The moment I start talking about how uh, immaculately well-played uh, Green's build is, you know, he makes a little oops and kills two of his own knights, but seriously, okay, so one of the reasons why this build works so well and it's so unique... What the fuck is this? I'll check back on that later. I'm a little... <laughs> I'm really into this right now. I'm enjoying myself. One of the reasons that this works so well is because he's bringing in the monks, right? Because the knights actually shit on this build. So I totally understand what Gray is going for here, and I think that he's been defending really nicely against this. Like, he's also been playing super well. But the monks are the thing that threw him uh, threw him for the loop. Thank you, John Bomb, by the way, for subscribing, as well as Timonius with a two-month resub. Thank you guys for the support. Really appreciate it. I think it's 50% off subscriptions during September, but if you watch this on YouTube, that month it all already ended. <laughs> So, the reason this is working so well is because the Aztecs have sick monks that gain 5 HP every time you research a monk upgrade technology. It used to be that their monks also created 15% faster, but we can't have nice things. And that is too strong. And they also get additional relic income. We see them not taking advantage of it here, and they just have a strong economy in general. Uh, this build's sick. When you're going for a gold-heavy army like this, this allows you to spend your food on you know, eco upgrades and actually just creating villagers, which I know his town centers are all idle, but I'm just gonna edit that in later. Trust me, he, he could be spending that food on villagers. Or he's saving it up for something. Redemption coming down here to threaten converting some buildings and or mangonels. It looks like he's actually gonna go for the stable conversion. Oh my god. This is so fucking sick. This is so sick. This is only working because he has the good monks, right? The, the knights we knew were coming from Grey. The way his build was set up, we saw the stable, we knew he was going for Fast Castle Age based off his eco balance and lack of any early game military units. This build is honestly fine, and with the Malians insanely powerful eco with their buildings discount, uh, thank god it no longer applies to farms as well as their faster gold mining, it's just it's just good. And the monks combined with the eagle warriors create a really tough pressure situation. What Green has done is he's created an army that is difficult to beat with ranged units because Eagle Warriors and Mangonels dumpster those. They deal with them very nicely. This is a well-balanced army, which is a really important concept to try to teach in all my videos. 
uh, backed by monks, which deal with knights, which are the counter to the Mangonel and Eagle Warrior type thing. Yeah, Eagle Warriors have like a plus three attack bonus versus cavalry units, but that doesn't make them good versus knights. It just makes them trade a little bit better. Timer is at 270 years remaining. Clayman is up to something with his double racks play, but alas. I mean, as long as he can just keep his villager production going, this guy could be the next the Viper, we'll see. He could be the next Doubt, I don't know. <laughs> Doubt's the one who's known for his unorthodox builds. The Viper is known for his absolutely disgusting efficiency. Ooh, he gets the conversions off and the healing. Look at these bulky monks. Back with a strong economy. Sanctity coming down. I think Sanctity is an excellent upgrade to get when you're facing knights because it allows you to live an additional two hits versus a knight, plus 15 HP on the monks. And if you're the Aztecs, it's an even stronger technology because it's actually plus 20 HP since they get the extra plus five. So I love this play here. I think that uh, what should Gray do in a situation like this? Because I think Green's build is just the perfect textbook, textbook example of balanced pressure. And getting this redemption technology here to not convert enemy mangonels is also very uncommon. It's actually forcing Gray to build a stable, a second stable. Alas, for those of you who are wondering, no, he can't build knights out of the stable he stole. But that is some, um, that's a big resource swing. That's what monks are all about. It's 175 wood down the drain for gray and 175 wood for green. And it's also time spent. This villager had to go build this new stable. What do you do if you're gray? I mean, I would say that you build mangonels, but I think that green is just flexing so hard right now with this. This is one of the best examples of, I think, uh, mind games and creative builds in Age of Empires 2 I've seen since I did my mind games and you know, counters videos. Because by getting redemption early and showing it off, what he's doing is he's he's flexing real hard on Gray, and he's like, I don't want you to be able to build defensive mangonels to deal with this army. And by getting Sanctity, he is just rubbing it in, because now those monks will live those mangonel blasts. And you want mangonels as a way to try and deal with these monks and the enemy def uh, the enemy mangonels as well. And he just doesn't, I feel like Gray just doesn't have good options here. At this point, he's got one option maybe, and I think that's a defensive castle. He has the gold for it, is that what he's going to do? Yes, he's building the market. Trust me, Kaladin is an insanely good player. I've been playing Telemachos now for like four years, and he's not born yesterday, not with those wrinkles. He knows what he's doing, and he's going to buy a castle. That's how you stop this build. Please tell me he's buying that castle. The question is where he's going to put it. He's got housed. He's yes. building a stable. What's he going to do? He also needs some help. I mean, his, his as far as, like, uh, ally in close proximity, it's, it's Clayman, so I don't think that the help's coming anytime soon. Clayman a little bit behind right now. Is he going to build a castle, or is he just trying to go imp? I think, I think going imp is crazy. What's he doing? Build a castle. Build it. Do it. Do it now! What, what's he doing? Is he build knight? He's building scouts. No, 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 no. I think you build a castle here. I think it's the only... Okay, so when your opponent is in a situation... Thank you, by the way, uh, Roro Uniad for subscribing with Twitch Prime, as well as Crazy Linux. Really appreciate it. 50% off subs during September, and if you can keep your subscription for just $5 a month, helps out a lot. I work 9 to 5. And I have a really busy life, so I really appreciate the support. I've been trying to keep Twitch and YouTube going all these years despite that. Uh, it's a big passion of mine. Thank you for supporting me. So, and the community, of course. Uh, when you are in a situation like this, which Gallatin is, where you are in the Castle Age, right? And you're dealing with pressure beyond your wildest dreams. You are facing the Viper. What do you do? Well, you need to survive. The only way to really stop aggression on this level is actually with a castle. Because uh, castles typically force games to go to the Imperial Age. And one of the things you always have to... Oh my god, he's actually clearing out this army. What the sh... Alright! I mean, this works too, man. <laughs> In general, I would say that the castle is the way to go. But, like... Do that market? I mean, but he's not really using the market. Just, he baited... He baited Green in so hard, and Green's economy is not very large at this point, and he just wanted to get some scouts out to pick up the monks, and once the monks were down, then he could just clean them up with some knights. I mean, that's that's one way to do it. But castles force games generally go to the Imperial Age. If you put it in a way that protects your economy in a defensive way, it takes usually like five battering rams to actually take it down. So it's a huge, huge resource commitment. And usually most players opt not to do that. You will see plenty of examples, though, in pro play of people actually committing to that, but most of the time... They opt to go to the Imperial Age, and then use the Trebuchet unit, leverage that insane range and attack bonus versus buildings to take down a castle from a safe distance and really close out a game. Because chances are, if you 
forced your opponent to build a defensive castle in the castle age then they're probably bottled in their base and you probably have some forward buildings that you can park a trebuchet behind and you have an army that can just protect it and then eventually your opponent's going to run out of stone repairing it the player that gets the imperial age first usually comes out on top of those situations uh, but it looks like gray gonna make a bold move and i've seen this before you saw this in my incas versus incas video if you haven't seen that one with klavskis uh, and akino hajima that video was absolutely awesome uh, kaladin making a Pretty sick play here by not going Imp. I still think now is the time to go Imp, though, right? The god, how did he defend against this? It's nuts. I mean, the answer is he defended against it by making a tough call here and plopping down three stables and just backing his base up. Notice how the entire time when Grey has been pressured that he has just been backing his eco up and he has never been letting up on the booming. And that's where I think most players screw up is that when they're under such immense pressure, they don't realize that their opponent is probably at an eco deficit Unless they're picking off so many of your villagers, like, they can't be that far ahead of you, right? So you need to keep your own economy production going in the background. Focus on that, and then maybe you can steadily wear them down. It looks like that's just what's happening here, is uh, Green's army was super duper vulnerable to light cavalry. I know that the, the converted knights actually beat the light cavalry, and the eagle warriors beat light cav too, but it's not that amazing. The light cav, you just focus fire down the monks, uh, with the attack bonus they have you focus right on the mangonels. And then kind of the meat of his army is down, and you only have to deal with the Eagle Warriors raiding and the Malian Town Centers, I think, are capable of taking that out. I really think, though, that he's got 3k gold in the bank, and he just... <laughs> well, his defense has been immaculate. I see no reason why he's not buying his way to Imp now. So for future reference, I think that's the play here. Uh, but no one plays perfectly, of course, uh, even the best players. Uh, sometimes they're, like, so focused on defending themselves that they don't... That they, uh, that they miss these types of things. But uh, for when you're playing around games, buy your way in, my friend. So Clayman, uh wasting a lot of resources here on an area that he couldn't possibly defend. So the reason that this doesn't work is because we look at the score, right? We're like, okay, 2,319, 9,000. So 2,300 is significantly smaller of a number than 9K. Holy shit, this game is going to be awesome. I really hope that someone shares this game. So these numbers are much, this is a much smaller number than all these other numbers. So don't forward your opponent in any, really 90% of the time, never forward your opponent if you are not in an advantageous situation of some kind, right? Uh, I think Clayman was flexing a little bit too hard and, oh, he's also only on one TC. That's no bueno. That That is never good. So he needs to build three more town centers now. Uh, a little scared to check his population. 29. Whoa! This guy's going to the Imperial Age. He thinks he's the Turks, but e even then, this is actually too few villagers for the Turks. Uh, whoa! This does not. This build does not work under any circumstances. <laughs> but I gotta admire Clayman's courage. So, this is just a bad idea. His economy is so small that you need a microscope to see it. Once he gets there, immediately out of gas. Once he spends these resources on what, like elite samurai? Like he can make like one or two elite samurai and then he's done. Okay, good, he is gonna build some extra town centers. Great to see that from Clayman. Really, he's just neglecting his Ika. I think he's flexing a little bit too hard and Eli probably on copious amounts of steroids with his Vikings, Arbalest, plus Seedram push. It's weird, you know, you look at the Vikings tech tree and you look at their set of bonuses and you probably think that this is the Civ where I make my awesome berserker gang army and just raid the crap out of my opponent with my insane infantry, and yeah, it does actually work sometimes. I have a great example of that you can find on my YouTube channel, I think in my Epic Age of Empires games playlist, uh, where uh, Huna OP goes for a sick Berserker build, but uh, actually the Arbalest plus Siege Ram combo is generally the most common opening from the Vikings, just because it has the strongest early Imperial Age power spike, like you, you have all this saved up food for the Siege Ram upgrade, uh, and you also have the economy get the Imperial Age really, really quickly with a free wheelbarrow and a handcart, and just that's the big power spike push. Meanwhile, Robsy with Siege Towers for some reason. I don't know. He's fearing the walls, which aren't a thing, but that's pretty sick. Mongol Siege Towers a drill? How fast are these if you put infantry in them? What? I like it. The flexor. So, anyway, Eli. Did the Siege Tower do anything? Because there's, there's like one stone wall here, so I don't think so. And it doesn't work on the other side of houses, which I cover in my uh, Siege Tower video. So here's here's one of the problems right now. is that, Oh my god, those are so fast. Move them again for me, please. One of the problems here is that Eli 
decided that he wanted to push Clayman out of the middle, assert his dominance, and then uh, it looks like he ended up getting betrayed here by Robsy. So that's that's real bad for him. I, my heart goes out to him. Robsy in an absolutely commanding position, and the Orange War Elephants, due to some bad map generation, are going to have to walk a long way around. What a powerful late game army, and this thing is not too shabby in the speed department, but he only has two, only two champions in here. All right, all right. Siege Tower's a drill? I'm feeling it. I, uh, I wonder why why champions, and I think that's just because he wants fast siege rams and he wants fast siege towers. Uh, the champions do beat these unupgraded berserks, it's just that uh, I think the opening up with champions is the... <laughs> He's just using them as like a transport to just drop champions around the base. Taking a page out of the Viper's playbook. So many crazy strategies I've seen in this game. Jeez, this is like five Break the Meta episodes in one. There are so many games that I've done which I could call Break the Meta episodes, but due to the format of the commentary and the fact that they aren't... Uh, expert players prevents me from putting that in the title. Uh, this is a de facto, this is honorary break the meta. What? <laughs> Hello everybody, Resonance here with a little bit of post-commentary. As we can see here, Robsy is about to drop the hottest mixtape of 2017. But what exactly is it about this build that is so creative and effective? Robsy is actually using Siege Towers here with Drill as a speedy transport for his champions to help them get around the enemy base and close the gap to enemy ranged units. This is actually brilliant, and better against archer units than I thought it would be. This strategy is immediately comparable to putting infantry units inside siege rams to help them get up close to enemy longbowmen. While this is certainly an unorthodox use of siege towers, we've recently seen the Viper use them as land transports too, and I think that's pretty cool. Siege towers were originally intended to mostly be a way to bypass thin layers of enemy walls, but this is a great example of how an odd set of attributes can really be put to good use. Siege Towers are very fast, and perhaps this is the type of meta-breaking niche that they might turn out to fit into really well. In this case, it's Drill that makes the Siege Towers hilarious. And now, without further ado, let's jump straight back into my live commentary and watch in awe just like I did on how incredibly effective this build can be in the right situation. Yeah, he's just using- he's using Siege Rams to raid! <laughs> Champions are not very fast units. They have like 1.9 movement speed. They're a little slower than a, uh, a little slower. Is it one? No, it's not 1.9 movement speed. No, I, that's their. I'm getting them mixed up. They have two attack speed. Their move speed is like way slower than that. I probably got that wrong. It's like 0.9 move speed or something. Uh, and this unit's slow. Siege Tower is one of the fastest uh, transport units in the game. It's way faster than the Siege Ram. So he's using Siege Towers in a way that. Uh, I don't generally see them being used. He's got Siege Towers with Drill, so they move 50% faster. He's using them as ways to transport his champions. His champions are so unbelievably good versus these Eagle Warriors, though, so I like that. Uh, and he's managed to kill Eli, whose score is absolutely fantastic, despite him being dead completely. <laughs> what a sick build! What is this? This build really fails hard versus strong infantry, so if Eli had elite berserks, for example, he would be dumpstering this build. But look how fast these things are. It's one of the weird aspects of the Siege Tower, is that it doesn't attack back. It's a really situational unit that you're supposed to use to drop units on the other side of a single layer of walls, but that really only comes into play in Arena. And here he's using it just for the insane movement speed, but drill 50% faster movement speed on siege weapons that the Mongols get as an upgrade. That's nuts. It's nuts, nuts, nuts. Meanwhile, Gazna. Phoenix coming out here with the Elite War Elephants. These old windscreen wipers for the 29 months resub, Crazy Linux for the $5 donation, and Tremor for the Twitch Prime sub. Really appreciate it, man. Uh, Crazy Linux says, I can't stop watching videos and stream. Have to get up at 5 a.m., which is about five hours here in Australia, but you're worth it. Thank you so much, Crazy Linux. Really appreciate it. I love reading everyone's comments on YouTube, uh, Twitch, and Reddit. Always makes my day when people go out of their way to leave me a nice comment. Thank you, thank you, thank you. As well as for those of you who take the time to respond to comments on my behalf, also saves me some time. So, this is one way to win a Free For All King of the Hill game. Generally speaking, we see players... A common strategy used by expert players is by putting some siege rams or some units with very high HP in the middle, because they're just very difficult to remove. Just parking the siege rams here, not having them attack anything, uh, can be enough to allow you to win the game, and Gazna, I mean, I hope that the opposing players have enough pikemen, monks, and heavy scorpions to take this army down. Uh, the Slavs are a remarkably well-equipped civilization to deal with the Persians, by the way, uh, considering that their halberdiers have Dragina, allowing them to do some cleave damage in AoE. I believe it's a flat 5 extract, just like the 
Uh, and ignore his resistances just like the uh, Elite Cataphract, but War Elephants deal 50% damage in AoE, so it's, it's actually different. Hey, jump bars mechanics are weird. Heavy Scorpions are what I want to see here. I, I understand the Siege Onagers try and deal some blast damage, but Heavy Scorpions actually have an attack bonus versus War Elephants. That's why we see them used that way uh, in deathmatch games more, more commonly. So... Everybody here has to give major props here to Kaladin, right, for holding out against one of the most insane early game pushes I have seen in a long time from the Aztecs. And I love it, man. This guy knows how to use his units. Rage Master as well with the Jaguar Warriors, which will absolutely dumpster this particular army of green, but will do nothing versus the War Elephants. I think Gazin is going to take it with some Persian Elite War Elephants. He's so confident he's going to take it that he's going to lose his base to Ravsi's just surprise... <laughs> surprise drive-by champions. What is this build? Uh, good to see Heavy Scorpions and Pikemen coming into play, but the Mongols, they feel like they're a Civ that has everything, but they don't. They don't have Helper Deers, and that is a big drawback in the situation. You really need Helper Deers to take this down. The difference in attack bonus, Pikemen only have plus 22, and Helper Deers, it's like 32 or something like that. It's it's way, way, way higher, and plus 2 base attack and extra HP and everything. Uh, it's a huge upgrade, especially when you're dealing with uh, Elephants. Actually, attack bonus is even higher versus Elephants. That's just versus Cavalry units. So, Mongols have some trouble dealing with this army. They do. Uh... Kaladin of the Hand Cannon years really like this unit choice too. He's been playing, he's been playing out of his mind. I mean, can they clear this out? They have 15 years remaining. This is every player in the world versus Orange, but I think Orange is going to come out on top. The Jaguar Warriors, I mean, like these are good versus all the Halbs, but like, dude, you gotta make units to kill the War Elephants because that's the only unit that matters here. The Jaguar Warriors are good versus the other players. That's maybe one extra dimension of chess, one dimension too far, I would say. I think that uh, Pikemen are the way to go, which he is making, and some Heavy Scorpions, which I believe... Wait, did Aztecs get Heavy Scorpions? They might only get Scorpions. Okay, so he can make Monks. I'm surprised that no one's actually making Monks, as Monks are one of the best ways to deal with Elephants, particularly Ballista Elephants, too, even. The best ways to deal with Battle Elephants, Ballistas, Indian War uh, Indian Elephant Archers, and Elite War Elephants. Great against all of them. Especially the Elite War Elephant, because it's the most expensive, it's the most slow. I'm shocked to see no monks from any of these players. Zero here is remaining. Wow. Clayman making Samurai, I do think, is a good decision, uh, as they do have an attack bonus versus uh, all unique units. It's like plus 12. And he's making Halberd Ears as well, which are a great answer. But no monks from anybody, I think, was probably a mistake. And I think that everyone just underestimated Gazna. <laughs> well played, Gazna. It was a lot closer than it seems. He didn't have that many elephants remaining. But the massive sheer bulk on them allowed him to seize victory. Quincun, thank you so much for subscribing. Really appreciate it. For those of you who are Amazon Prime uh, users, you can actually subscribe to me on, for free on Twitch with Twitch Prime. Pretty snazzy. This is a great game here from everybody. I think people played this one fantastically. Uh, Eli with a nice surprise push in the middle of the game. Unfortunately, just got mopped up by one of the most bizarre builds I've ever seen in competitive Age of Empires 2 from Rob C. The Drill Siege Tower Siege Ram Champion push but it's good to see that when players are experimenting with these kind of crazy builds, that they actually are adapting and trying to do things that are smart for the situation. In this case, Ravsi, his Blitzkrieg-style push, there's no real other way to describe it, allowed him to completely take Eli by surprise, remove him from the game before Eli had even a chance to transition into units that would counter it, such as uh, champions and or elite berserks. We saw he just didn't have any time at all to make those counter units. And it allowed him to just secure map control like crazy, do some raiding on green, and I think that green was one of his targets for sure with the champions, and they transitioned into the correct units, which I think is a combination of pikemen and heavy scorps, but no monks from really anybody I think was a big mistake, particularly when we have an Aztecs player floating around, I think that you really want monks. No monks from anybody. <laughs> and Orange just saw a promising opportunity with mass elite war elephants. This video had everything, and I have no idea what I'm going to call it in this idol. It was a sick game. Unfortunately, Clayman didn't get to do too much this game, but you know, good good to see him making a secondary town center. I mean, really, the main thing that the main mistake he made, I think, was building this castle here, uh, in that he just had no way he could possibly protect that one. I think that castle could have been in his own base. It would have allowed him to have two castles to defend himself, and then he just needed to make more villagers. But otherwise, though, he was making the correct units for the situation, absolutely, with the halberd years plus elite samurai. Uh, Clayman perhaps will get his revenge on the stream in the future. We'll see about that. 
See what's in Clayman's pocketbook, because I know he's got he's got a lot of strategies in his bag of tricks. Always a pleasure to watch him. So, GG man, Gazna with an incredible unit kill to two units lost ratio. Largest army, 101. Man, you know that he was. See, look at okay. This makes the difference. 172 villagers for Gazna. He actually needed to boom that hard to be able to sustain elite war elephant production because it's so expensive. But as he was losing his villagers, he was confident enough that he was going to win that he didn't really devote any resources to defending his own base. So instead, he spent all of his remaining stockpiled resources on elite war elephants. So this is what I would call an elite war elephant all-in. <laughs> Layman says, uh, my texture pack has the same look for water and shallows, though the monument was on a peninsula. Oops. <laughs> call the video Hannibal Elephants. There's so many things I could call this one. Uh, I think that there is an excellent Malian's defense here. There's some insane build from Ravsi. Um, Eli had a great little Vikings push. Kaladin with an immaculately well-crafted Malian's defense. Uh, and we have the elite war elephants. Ravsi's drive-by, like, it's just nuts. <laughs> Absolutely nuts. And Jomnal also making all the right units for the situation. I feel like he had the... The Slavs have the tools to deal with this. I think he just got cut by surprise a little bit. Uh, by how efficiently Gazna was able to boom up. I mean, he didn't make any military units at all for the longest time, and he really boomed up. That he did. None of the players here were quite prepared, and I would have liked to have seen some monks. I think it's the moral of the story, but it's cool to see people actually using heavy scorpions. It's one of the ways to deal with the, uh, the war elephants. You get a lot of pass-through damage on them, pretty slow, uh, and then just mass pikemen, but they didn't react in time. Great little free-for-all King of the Hill game. As always, I appreciate the support. Uh, you can find everything you need and more in the video description below. Uh, please leave a like and a comment. I read them all. Uh, you can find my Facebook and Twitter page. I stream on Twitch regularly. The live stream schedule is there if you scroll underneath the video player. And again, the best way to support the channel is to support the content I do for games beyond just Age of Empires 2. So, thank you so much. I know who you are. It helps motivate me to produce AW content and also just expand the community. This was awesome. Now, I do indeed have to go now because I am hosting a bunch of uh, friends today. They are coming over uh, a week after my birthday to celebrate my birthday since they were super busy uh, last weekend. So we'll be doing that today, playing some games. Maybe I'll even play some Age of Empires with them. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and being awesome, everybody. I got a bunch of new subs today. And I hope to see you all next week. Please follow uh, please follow my Twitch stream. And if you are craving more Age of Empires 2, then just check out my YouTube channel. I only have uh, like 600 videos on the game. <laughs> I'm going to run a quick ad. Thank you so much for tuning in to being awesome. And for those of you who played with me today, is your relief how old are you this year? I am now 23. Thank you for all the late birthday wishes. Good to see you, Spooky Magician. Much appreciated, Morat. Hey, G-Man Wallace. Thank you, thank you. Always a pleasure to have you all. Thank you for sharing my content around and being, being cool. Isu says, we're your real friends. You guys are my friends. I think that we have one of the best communities on YouTube and Twitch, and I certainly don't take it for granted. And what a crazy game this was. <laughs> I really hope that people see this one. This is a must-watch. Now I just have to figure out what I want to title it, and I need to come up with a badass thumbnail. We're working on it. All right, we'll see you all next week. You guys are awesome. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, let's see, and don't forget to watch the... Uh, Forgotten Kingdoms Rise Up Tournament. See if there's anyone I can host. I mean, I'll, I'll host the Viper stream. <laughs> so everybody, uh, everybody here, hop in the Viper's chat and say hello from Resonance 22 in about 30 seconds. After I run a quick ad, I will host the Viper stream. Um, and then I encourage you to go to my YouTube channel to watch more Age of Empires 2 when he's done streaming. Okay. Oh, Siege Tower. <laughs> <gasps> oh my god, are you serious? Oh, is this the one time? Oh my god. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we've done it. We've won the Age of Empires. Oh, jeez. Truly a moment to go down in history books. Ever since African Kingdoms was released, this is the first time. No one has, literally no one's ever done that. <laughs> are you kidding me? Wow, this this thing can only hold 10 units? This unit is trash. It costs... Oh my god, it costs more than my college tuition. Get in the fucking... Just, there we go. Idiots. <laughs> wow. 
Feels weird, man. Alright, does this unit work? What the fuck is he doing? I can't tell if he's moonwalking or not. Drop it off. Oh, you only dropped off... Okay, alright, drop off the other four. Dr drop off the... Oh my god. This unit is so bad. <laughs> just, just unload. Not enough room? What? Just do it. <laughs> Blackens, I am attacking the wall. There we go. Oh my god. <laughs> He's telling me there's not enough room. You ever wanted to know how bad unit pathing is in Age of Empires 2? Have you used one of these units? Oh man. Yeah, you learn a lot about the game mechanics, I'll tell you. Well. Also, the siege tower is pretty buggy, and sometimes it fails to unload even if there are no obstacles, or it tries to path around the wall instead of unloading.